song will be on page 382 at the bottom.
Remember the uh, brother Jesus, and sister Judy. Remember Sister Linda Miller. Remember Sister Holly Bay and her health. Remember Sister Judy still be for prayer. Remember Jenny Wynn and Sister Larry. Linda Fox in the vision from stage four cancer. Remember Sister Vaughn Miller. Remember Sister Sandy's daughter Bella. Brother Chuck's friend, the Coke family. Remember Gary Walker Jr. Remember Brother James and Sister James. Remember Brother Charlie and his friends. Did for the girl all meeting prayers. Uh, Brother Charlie just informed me this morning that he did pass away. Linda Miller's son Andy needs our prayers. Remember Chris Carlisle's wife, Katie, had to do undergo procedures for bleeding blood. Remember Lori's sister, Linda. Katie Fatter, remember Sister Diane and her niece, Linda. Sister Diane's granddaughter, Michaela, has genetic disease affecting her body, needs our prayers. Remember Sister Berta, recovered from surgery. Lori's cousin, Danny, passed away from her little bit. Again, we'd like to say good morning to everybody. I wish I could say it is a sunny, sunshiny, warm Sunday morning. Uh, that's maybe next week. Who knows? <laughs> if we uh, were, were to be here tomorrow, uh, we should kind of uh, say that that's a possibility by noontime. But uh, well, that's tomorrow. It's not today. And today is not nice and warm out there. But uh, we wish you the best if you have to get out today. Uh, dress warm, have fun, and uh, just look forward to the days uh, getting warmer. How many of you are enjoying looking outside at 8 o'clock and seeing a little bit of daylight left? Yeah. For those of you who don't enjoy it, I feel sorry for you. I enjoy it. <laughs> I'll enjoy it for you. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I really hate looking outside at 5.30 at night and it's pitch black. You can't see anything out there. It's dark at 5.30. I, I really, really do hate that. It's something that makes me some kind of seriously unhappy. But that's only for a few weeks out in the winter and then it starts coming back. And praise God, there will be a day here. Good Lord willing, if this earth stands long enough, that we'll look outside 9.30 still be quite outside. That won't last very long, but we enjoy that too. Somebody here this morning when I just stand up and praise God, he's been good to you, gave you a special blessing and you want to share it with the, with the church. Who wants to be first? Somebody else want to praise the Lord this morning? There was one little neat thing that I picked up on the news down through the week. Um, you may not enjoy it as much as I did, but uh, I, I really... I guess you could say I said thank you, Lord, for it. Miami Beach usually is a problem on spring break. And the police department, the Florida Highway Patrol or State Police, whatever, 
uh, the National Guard, the governor, they all got together and sat down and said, what can we do? And the governor, or the mayor of Miami said, well, let's try a curfew. Off the streets at midnight, and you can't come out until after 6 o'clock in the morning, something like that. If you're on the streets, you're arrested. Period. And the rest of them kind of agreed to that. And they put the word out to the kids, off the streets by midnight. If you're on the streets at midnight, you will get arrested. If you park your car in the wrong place, it's a $500 fine, along with the tow bill, along with the parking bill. That's the wrong idea, but you know what I'm talking about. Well, the kids heard the news, and the kids settled down. Um, the week is over with, and everyone down there is just super glad and happy. The uh, folks, the restaurants and whatever well, bars, I hate to say that, but the restaurants, the bars, the uh, theaters, and the shopping places all had a good time. They made money. They enjoyed the kids being there. Uh, there was no shootings that I was able to see, which they've had before. There was no killings, uh, no robbings of any great importance. Uh, I just thank God that, you know, some people got together and said, you know, let's do something about this. And uh, they gave the police the permission or authority or responsibility, whatever term you want to say. And uh, they got it taken care of. I thought it was pretty neat. <laughs> it was good for, it really good for the kids, you know. It's good for the city, don't get me wrong. I, I like that. But what was really good was good for the kids. The kids all came back home safe and sound. Maybe a few of them with hangovers, but whatever. They came home safe and sound. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got robbed. That was good. Somebody else want to praise the Lord this morning? Anybody got a song? Okay, we'll go right into the message. Last week in our message, we revisited a battle that God had with Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir. They had taken it upon themselves to have the idea that they were going to take over, overrun, and overthrow Israel. And uh, God sent a message to Jehaziel to tell the nation of Israel not to worry about it, the battle was God's. And you know, that's part of the last week's message, that's, that's what we were trying to get out. Don't fight the battle yourself, give it to him. He'll take care of it. He took care of my biological father is getting saved. Uh, you heard the testimony back there from Sis about her, uh, I forget how the relationship goes, but her relative uh, that got saved. Uh, sometimes we have to quit. Get our hands out of it. Give it to God. Let him take care of it. And Jehoshaphat was told by God, get your hands out of this. Leave it alone. I will take care of it. <laughs> What was neat a couple days later when they went out to, they had to go out to present themselves for the battle. And when they went out uh, on the battleground to present themselves, they started looking and all they found was bones. Apparently, uh, Ammon and Moab got all mad at Mount Seir or thought they were Israel coming out after them. They did not, nobody really knows what happened there other than God pitted them together and when that battle was over with and Mount Seir was whooped, uh, Ammon and Moab, they went together and fought a battle. And when that was all over and whoever was left went home, Israel came out and found nothing but bodies. And of course, one of the things, uh, we don't necessarily do that now, but back in those days when the battle was over, the winners plundered the place. They went to the bodies of those that were there and they picked up the weapons. If there was any jewelry, they picked up the jewelry. If there was any clothing worth keeping, they grabbed it. So for the next two or three days, the Israelites plundered the bodies of their enemies and uh, thank God that they didn't have to fight. They didn't have to die. But uh, God won that war without a doubt. And about 1991 years ago, uh, in this particular part of the year, Israel, there was another even greater war uh, ready to take place. The first war uh, protected the nation of Israel and gave them a place to live 
and allowed them to grow and become a great nation. And of course, both wars took place in Israel. But about 800 years after the battle that I just told you about, uh, a fellow by the name of Pompey the Great, who was one of three who was ruling Rome at that time, took over and uh, conquered Israel. And uh, by the time we get up to our story, uh, Israel had been conquered for about 66 years. Um, and then about 33 years after that, this second battle, or second war that I want to tell you about today, began. Many saw the battles of the second war, but they did not recognize it for what it truly was. It was the battle for the souls of men. The first war was for the bodies and the nation of Israel, that they could live a natural life. The second war was for the souls of men, that they could live eternally in heaven. And of course, you know where we're going there. Those who battled were Satan and Jesus Christ. Today is the day that we commemorate Jesus coming into Israel, riding the donkey. We call it Palm Sunday, of course. That's on your bulletin this morning. An image of Jesus riding the donkey into Israel. And it started this way right here. And he saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye to that to the man the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. Would you bow your heads with me? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on Palm Sunday, the day when the crowds lined the walls of Jerusalem outside the door or the eastern gate of Jerusalem. They heard that Jesus was coming. Many of them had never seen Jesus. Some of them came to see a man that they'd already seen who had done great wonders in the city of Jerusalem. Others came to see a man they'd only heard about, had never seen. And some came to see the enemy, the enemy that they thought was going to take away their way of living, that they thought was doing so much wrong. They, many of them came for many different reasons, but the majority of the crowd came to see the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I just wish that we could have all been there. But one of these days, we will not see him come into Jerusalem on a donkey. This time, he will come into Jerusalem on a white horse, coming to get us. The dead in Christ will rise first. We will be changed, go up into the air and meet him, and we will forever be with the Lord. We thank you, Father, and know that this is going to happen one day. Not today, perhaps, but one day it will occur. We thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name they all said, Amen. Amen. Well, again, he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. He had been in Bethany. Uh, he had been there with Mary and Martha Joseph, who had been there to uh, have a weekend with him, it was now time to start the last week of his life. And uh, he started that last week by coming to Jerusalem, and again, he told his two of his disciples to go get a donkey. I'm going to ride into Jerusalem. And uh, it goes on just a little bit farther. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. He that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The crowds 
made it plain, absolutely plain. They were fully and wonderfully glad that Jesus was now coming to visit the capital city of Israel. This was just a few days before Passover. Their greatest holiday was getting ready to start. Many people were in Jerusalem simply for the Passover. Some of them came from down south. Uh, some of them came from the uh, east coast over at Jordan uh, on the Jordan River. Some came from the west coast over near the Mediterranean Sea. Many of these people had only heard about Jesus. They had never seen him. So when they heard he was coming uh, to Jerusalem for the Passover week, they were just thrilled that they were going to get to, for the first time or some other time in their life, they were going to get to see this man called Jesus, this man who opened blinded eyes, this man who raised the dead, this man who called out demons, who called out devils, this man who had done all sorts of good things. And you know the funny part about almost all people that we've known for a number of years, there will be some little something in the background that we didn't like about them. They had a nasty mouth, or they did this, or they did that, or they did something we didn't like. Most people that we know, we have something along those lines. And a lot of you know, the biggest part of the time, it doesn't make any difference. But there's something there. With Jesus, you either loved him and couldn't find one thing, not one thing you could find against him, or it looked like he was going to destroy your way of living, so you hated him for all there was in it. Those were the two factions of people. But uh, when the crowds saw Jesus coming in, it was kind of neat. Jesus won that little battle of war. And then when we look at this overall war, we see some of the little known battles that Jesus fought, the ones that are not necessarily recognized. Uh, and uh, it really becomes one we're glad that we did not have to fight. And to start with, our first scripture up there <clears throat> said that the donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem had never had anybody on his back. I'm glad I wasn't that person. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to ride an animal, a uh, horse or a donkey or a mule, that's never been ridden before. Um, it's an experience, we'll leave it at that. Even if they have been ridden, sometimes it's still an experience, um, we'll leave it at that. Uh, they put their outer garments on the donkey, they picked Jesus up and sat him on the donkey, Never was a dime's worth of trouble. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the donkey could have thrown Jesus off in the dirt. He didn't. Jesus kind of won that little battle, too. <laughs> uh, but the second battle that Jesus won was the foreknowledge of Jesus. And you have to remember, Jesus was also God in the flesh. So he was able to look ahead in time he knew of things that the rest of us didn't. He had the foreknowledge that a man who had been with him for most, if not all, of his three and a half years of ministry, a man had made a deal to betray him, had sold him for 30 pieces of silver. We use that term, 30 pieces of silver, but there's another term for that same piece of silver Jesus talked about and he called it a penny. This 30 pieces of silver was the price of an average slave or it was the price of 30 days labor. Would any of us sell our best friend for the price of 30 days labor? Nobody ever knows exactly the reason that Judas sold Jesus. But the promise was 
if he got the 30 pieces of silver, that he would lead Jesus' detractors to him in such a manner that they could take him, they could bind him, and they could get him away from the crowds without a crowd being there to stop him. And again, Jesus was with Jesus for most, if not all, of his three and a half year ministry. Judas actually was the one man out of the entire group of disciples that knew the most about money because he was their treasurer. That's what he did for them. But for the price of a slave, for the price of 30 days labor, Judas sold Jesus. Jesus won that battle also because Judas never did get to spend one penny, one dime, one nickel of that money. When he saw and found out all of what he had done, he took the money back and tried to buy back Jesus. The priests, the high priest, and his friends in the temple said, no, it's not going to happen. And Judas threw the money down and left. And the Bible says he went out and hung himself. He repented and went out and hung himself. And falling down, his bowels gushed out. He lost his life. He lost his relationship with Jesus Christ. And he lost his 30 pieces of silver. And again, you know, we can say that Jesus won that battle as well. But then comes the beginning of the true Satan versus Jesus part of the battle. Satan sent his messengers to belittle Jesus, to question him, to accuse him, and once they got him, they took him to Pontius Pilate for a trial. While he was there at the trial, Jesus talked back to the high priest, and one of the men there slapped him across the face for being disrespectful to the high priest. Jesus put up with that. They demanded that Jesus inform them of the source of his authority and the source of his power. He had come into the temple area there. He had dumped their tables over. He had sent the donkeys that were for sale, the lambs that were for sale, and the doves that were for sale. Uh, he turned over the tables of the money changers. He told them to get out of the temple. He said, this is God's house. It is made for worship. It is not made for selling and buying. It's not made to be a place of money exchanging. And you know, there are people that <clears throat> come here to our yard sale. They come into our fellowship hall. And it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally someone will take their hand and point toward the sanctuary. Is there anything in there? No, there's nothing in here. I was at a church one time with a friend of mine. We had gone to the yard sale. We went out back to the tables that they had. There was nothing there. And there's a sign that said, more inside. And we looked at each other and thought, there can't be much in there because it was just a little part of the building, just like our entryway out there. We walked over and went in anyway. And uh, one of the ladies, or one of the guys, I forget which it was, said, oh, the rest of it's in there. We walked in. They had moved the chairs out of the sanctuary, had tables in the sanctuary, just like ours in here, and were selling and buying. We didn't buy a thing. We didn't trade a thing. In fact, I stuck my hands in my pockets and when we walked, when we walked out, I looked down less at his hands in his pockets. <laughs> we, we weren't even going to touch anything in there. But God does not want his house to be belittled. He doesn't want it overthrown. He doesn't want it to have those kinds of things. And that's what was going on. Between the overthrowing of the money changers' tables and the cleansing of the temple, that 
And the fact that Jesus was healed. He was healing blinded eyes. He was healing lepers. He was raising them from the dead. And here these people were the priests of the nation and the high priests. They could do nothing. So it was an aggravation to their, to them. And uh, they did everything they could to prove that Jesus Christ was wrong. That Jesus Christ wasn't what some people expected him to be, and that is the Messiah. When they questioned him, and they asked him, are you the Son of God? And he said, well, you've said it. They then accused him of blasphemy. That was the final charge that they were able to make stick in their minds. That he blasphemed God by saying he was God's son. The blasphemy was the charge that they were able to wrap on him and charge him with. He was sent to Herod. Herod had, was one who wanted to see him. He was sent to Herod. He did not do a miracle while he was there, and that was why Herod wanted to see Jesus Christ to do some sort of a miracle. He did not do one there. Herod was angry, sent him back. Pilate then tried his best because he understood and realized this man is innocent. His wife came out and said, have you nothing to do with this innocent man? And Pilate tried. I, I'll give him a little bit of effort there. He did try to get the people to change their mind. He tried to offer them up Barabbas. Would you have Barabbas or would you have Jesus? Barabbas was a known murderer, a known criminal. He was a he was a bad guy and everybody knew it. But the priests and the crowd hollered, give us Barabbas. What would you have me do with Jesus? Crucify him.
12 legions of angels, but Jesus didn't do it. And the reason Jesus didn't do it was because if he did not die on the cross, on Easter Sunday morning, he could not come out of the grave. And if he could not come out of the grave, you and I could not stand before God the Father and say, Father God, in heaven's name, in Jesus' name, I repent of my sin. If he had not died on that cross, if he had called for those 80,000 angels, you and I do not have what we have today. Raise your hand if you have salvation by the grace of Almighty God. Raise your hand if you're proud to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Raise your hand if you're glad that He fought that battle and won that battle. That's what He could have done. That's the power that He had. Twelve legions of angels. It depends on how you count the legions, for they were counted in different ways. But just an average count of 12 legions of angels would have been 80,000 angels. <laughs> I don't know what would have happened if 80,000 angels would have showed up. But it would have been good, Brother Jim. <laughs> uh -oh, thank God. And you know, I've often had an image. A number of years ago, I was preparing the message. And this image came to me, and I've seen it many, many times since then. An angel standing with his hand on his sword, looking over at Almighty God, looking down at Jesus Christ, and saying, can I go? Can I go? Is it time? And God said, no. You can't go. He has to finish that work. I thank God that he did finish that work. I thank God that he not only won all of those little battles, but he won the war. It's good to win a battle here and there, but it's better to win the war, finally. World War II in the Pacific Theater, we as Americans lost a number of battles. There was a number of times when the Japanese were victorious, that they, glory hallelujah, they had won the battle. But when it was all said and done, in September of 1945, it was Japan that signed the agreement, we give up 100%. We are no longer combatants with the United States. We lost a few battles, but we won the war. Jesus lost, in the eyes of some people, some of these battles. But when it was all over with, he won the war. And I think he won those little battles, too. When you stop and think about the end product he won. And today, again, it commemorates the day we earlier spoke about, where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to start crucifixion week. Uh, let us all today, as we come to the close of today's service, let us all thank God that when Jesus could have given in to his earthly pain, when he could have lashed out at his enemies, when he could have seen his enemies all die before his eyes, he loved us not. He loved us enough to not call his angels. He loved us enough to suffer the pain, to give his only life that he had for us. Let us be thankful for that. He won the final battle and the war for our souls. Can we all say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus, yes. Let's all stand this morning. I suppose Jerry has music set up for just as I am. And as the song plays, perhaps today someone has a reason if you would like to come and pray. Is there one this morning? Say, Brother Lord, I need prayer.
Please be with us as we part ways until we return in Jesus' name.